If you've ever traveled on a commercial airline in your life, there's an almost 50% chance that the airplane was made by Boeing. Out of the 28,000 plus active commercial airplanes in the sky right now, half of them are owned by Boeing, the same company that killed hundreds of its passengers over greed. Jakarta, October 29, 2018 Flight number JT610 took off from Sukarno, Hatta International Airport at 6.20 a.m. The flight's destination was Pangkal, Pinyang, and it was scheduled to arrive at 7.20 a.m. The crew consisted of Captain Bavi Sunyeha, a 31-year-old Indian with over seven years' experience on the airline, boasting 6,028 flight hours. Accompanying him was co-pilot Harvino, a 41-year-old Indonesian who was also a very experienced pilot and six Indonesian flight attendants. The plane in question was a Boeing 737 MAX 8 equipped with two CFM International LEAP engines. It completed its inaugural flight on July 30th, 2018 and was handed over to Lion Air as a new delivery on August 13th, 2018. The flight took off and just after a few minutes in the air, the pilot started to notice that the aircraft was behaving strangely. The plane had started off westward but then circled its nose towards northeast. As the malfunctions became worse, the plane started to nosedive. Suneha asked Harvino to take the yoke while he immediately started to skim through the control guide, but it was no use. Communication between air traffic control and flight 610 was suddenly lost at 6.33 a.m just 13 minutes into the flight. At 7.30 a.m., the agency received notifications that Flight 610 had experienced a crash a few kilometers away from an offshore oil platform. Witnesses on the platform reported observing the aircraft go down at a sharp nose-down angle. Promptly, boats from the platform were dispatched and wreckage from the crash plane was discovered shortly thereafter. Lion Air Flight 610 went missing from radar just a few minutes after taking off from Jakarta. A brand new Boeing 737 with 189 people on board. 189 people died. There were no survivors. Bodies washed up at the shoreline. Families were left devastated, looking through the debris for any remnants of their loved ones. Investigations commenced and the findings were horrible. The crash occurred because of the MCAS system on board the 737 MAX. Weirdly enough, the 737s weren't grounded. Boeing blamed the pilots of the Lion Air flight and operations of the 737 continued as usual. The bottom line here is the 737 MAX is safe. Four months later, tragedy struck again. Ethiopia, March 10, 2019. Ethiopian Airlines flight has crashed shortly after takeoff from Addis Ababa, killing all 157 passengers and crew thought to be on board. Flight 302 was a planned international passenger flight from Addis Ababa to Nairobi. Departing from Addis Ababa at 8.38 a.m., the aircraft carried 149 passengers and had a crew of eight members on board. One minute after takeoff, the first officer following the captain's instructions told the control tower about a flight control problem. Two minutes later, the plane's MCAS system activated, causing the plane to dive towards the ground. The pilot struggled to control it, preventing the nose from diving further, but the plane kept losing altitude. The MCAS activated again, making the nose drop even more. The pilots turned off the electrical trim tab system to disable the MCAS, but this also turned off their ability to adjust the stabilizer. Trying to manually move the stabilizer by hand failed due to strong aerodynamic forces. Because the pilots accidentally left the engines at full takeoff power, the plane sped up, putting more pressure on the stabilizer. The pilots' attempts to manually adjust it failed. Three minutes into the flight, as the plane continued to lose altitude and go beyond its safety limits, the captain asked air traffic control to return to the airport. They got permission, and the controllers redirected other flights. Following air traffic control's instructions, they turned the plane to the east, causing it to roll to the right with the right wing pointing downward. At 8.43, struggling to keep the nose from diving further by pulling the yoke, the captain asked the first officer for help. They turned the electrical trim tab system back on, hoping to adjust the stabilizer. Unfortunately, this also reactivated the MCAS, pushing the nose down. Despite their efforts to pull up, the plane kept heading toward the ground. 
The aircraft disappeared from radar screens and crashed around 8.44, six minutes after takeoff. Flight data showed the altitude and climb descent rate were unstable. Witnesses reported seeing white smoke and hearing strange noises before the crash. The plane hit the ground at nearly 700 miles per hour. Sadly, there were no survivors. The crash occurred in Gimbuchu Oromia region near Bishoftu, 62 kilometers southeast of Bol International Airport. The impact created a large crater and wreckage, personal belongings and body parts were scattered around the field. Boeing faces a lot of safety questions this morning because this is the second crash in just five months involving their best-selling passenger jet. The Boeing 737 MAX passengers airliner was grounded worldwide between March 2019 and December 2020. Again, the problem was the same, the faulty MCAS system. Now, before we get to breaking down the MCAS system and why these crashes kept happening, we first need to look at the history of the company behind the planes. Boeing began in 1916 when American lumber magnate William E. Boeing established Pacific Aero Products Company in Seattle, Washington. Just before this, he and Conrad Westervelt developed the B&W seaplane. The company started off driven by engineers who had a love for aviation. In 1931, the group combined its four smaller airlines to create United Airlines. However, in 1934, regulations mandated the separation of aircraft manufacturing from air transportation. As a result, Boeing Airplane Company emerged as one of the three main entities following the dissolution of United Aircraft and Transport. The other two entities were United Aircraft, later United Technologies, and United Airlines. Pan American introduced overseas flights on 707s in October 1958. National Airlines quickly started offering domestic jet service using a 707 borrowed from Pan Am. Boeing designed the 707 for transcontinental or one-stop transatlantic range. However, with modifications like extra fuel tanks and more efficient turbofan engines, 707-300s could fly non-stop across the Atlantic. Boeing produced a total of 855 707s. The Pratt & Whitney JT-3 transformed air transportation when it started operating on the Boeing 707 in 1958. This new turbojet engine was a commercial version of the U.S. Air Force's J-53 introduced in 1950. In the early 1960s, the JT-3 was adapted into a low-bypass turbofan known as the JT-3D. The initial three compressor stages were replaced with two fan stages that extended beyond the compressor casing, resembling propellers. This modification increased airflow, reducing fuel consumption, noise, and emissions. The JT-3Ds became widely used, especially on long-range Boeing 707-300s and Douglas DC-8s. Pan American and Boeing ushered in a new era in commercial aviation when the first Boeing 747 went into service in January 1970. Originally designed for Pan American to replace the 707, the 747 offered significantly lower seat mile costs. It could carry 400 passengers and later versions even more, more than twice the number carried by the 707. Other wide-body designs followed, including the three-engine McDonnell Douglas DC-10 Lockheed L-1011 TriStar and the twin-engine Airbus A300. With its high bypass turbofan engines and immense seating capacity, the Boeing 747 transformed air travel by making flying more affordable. It quickly became the preferred airliner for long-range service. But that would all change in December 1996. Good evening, everyone. It is a multi-billion dollar deal that is sending shockwaves through the aerospace industry. The planned merger between the Boeing company and McDonnell Douglas. Boeing revealed plans to merge with McDonnell Douglas. After obtaining regulatory approval, the merger was finalized on August 4, 1997. Numerous Boeing workers were laid off and the once passionate aviation company was now becoming more and more of a business. In 2008 and 2009, Boeing held the second position on the top 100 U.S. federal contractors list, securing contracts amounting to $22 billion U.S. dollars and $23 billion U.S. dollars respectively. From 1995 to early 2021, the company committed to paying $4.3 billion U.S. dollars to settle 84 cases of misconduct. This included a settlement of $615 million U.S. dollars in 2006 concerning the illegal hiring of government officials and improper use of proprietary information. 
It was reported that Boeing engineers were now violating a law of safety guidelines. Often airplanes were found to have tools left near key wiring points inside the plane after maintenance. After the 2018 Lion Air crash in 2019, Boeing faced growing criticism for its inadequate handling of its faulty planes sold to Korean clients. According to the US aerospace giant, its maintenance team was dispatched to repair defective Boeing B737 next generations, but didn't arrive on time. The government grounded the 13 Boeing aircraft for cracks on a component of the plane called a pickle fork, which connects the wing to the aircraft fuselage. A failure of this component in flight could have dire consequences. However, there were not enough engineers and they took a longer time to check local airlines defective planes in Korea, with some airlines deciding to send the planes to the United States at their own expense. Instances like these really were tarnishing the name of the once industry-leading company. MCAS System Failure One big ethical problem in the Boeing 737 MAX situation was choosing to save money and meet deadlines instead of focusing on safety. Reports say that they hired developers for the 737 MAX software at low pay. This decision led to poor communication among engineering teams, possibly causing the MCAS system to fail. Boeing risked the lives of passengers and workers by putting saving money before safety concerns. Even though the engineers designing the MCAS system knew about their concerns, they chose to ignore them. Boeing breached trust with its consumers and FAA by hiding information about the MCAS system. Going against ethical standards, this choice led to two fatal accidents, causing the loss of 346 lives and severely damaging the company's reputation. In the Boeing 737 MAX case, the engineers tried to deal with ethical issues within the company. They raised concerns about software development being outsourced and poor coordination among technical teams. Unfortunately, their warnings were dismissed or rejected by management. Engineers faced pressure to meet deadlines and cut costs, making it hard to prioritize safety over profit. Despite the challenges, some engineers persisted in expressing worries about potential issues with the MCAS system. For instance, one Boeing engineer had concerns about the system's design during the aircraft's development. However, management disregarded his reservations and the technology was installed as originally planned. Several of Boeing's workers also faced threats from their own company. Conditions were becoming horrible inside the company. He told me flat out, he said, I'm going to push you until you break and then I'm going to come in and fix you. He told me several times. Well, they broke me. In the cases of flights ET-302 and JT-610, investigators found that MCAS was activated due to incorrect angle of attack or AOA inputs, falsely indicating a significant pitch up of the plane. Shortly after takeoff on both flights, MCAS repeatedly adjusted the horizontal stabilizer trim motor to push down the airplane's nose. Satellite data revealed that the planes faced challenges in gaining altitude. Pilots reported difficulty in controlling the aircraft and requested to return to the airport. The use of MCAS was also found to interfere with autopilot operations. Uh, certainly the Lion Air pilots didn't know what was happening, appeared to be very confused. And the system just wore them down until it plunged into the sea. After the initial crash, Boeing and Mullenberg were aware that MCAS posed an ongoing airplane safety issue. However, they still reassured the public that the 737 MAX airplane was as safe as any airplane that has ever flown the skies. Subsequently, after the second crash, Boeing and Mullenberg continued to assure the public that there were no issues or shortcomings in the certification process related to MCAS, despite being aware of information to the contrary. The major flaw with the MCAS system was that it took values from only one angle of attack sensor located on the nose, meaning that if anything happened to the sensor and the readings it started taking were incorrect, the whole flight would be doomed. A more favorable and safe approach would have been to include two sensors at the front which took their own individual readings and then compared them with each other. If there was an anomaly, the system could detect it and then present it to the pilot. That's everything wrong with this system, but the story takes an even darker turn. In an effort to get the new plane into the market as fast as possible, the company didn't adequately train the pilots. Some of the pilots testified that they were just given a few hours of iPad training, 
meaning they were just given a small presentation, and Boeing didn't inform the pilots about the MCAS system in detail. If the pilots were briefed in detail, they would just turn off the MCAS system and land the plane manually. All 346 deaths could have been avoided if the pilots were briefed about the ticking time bomb present in the plane they were flying. Legal Battles Chicago aviation attorney David Rappaport, who was representing family members of those lost in the Ethiopian Airlines crash, expressed astonishment at the recent comments expressed by Muhlenberg that Boeing won't own responsibility for the deficient design of its aircraft after two well-qualified sets of pilots at two internationally respected airlines lost control of two different brand new aircraft is sad. Instead of Boeing and its lawyers posturing to defend its weak design choices, they should be helping the families of those who died in the crashes. Unfortunately, the job of getting to the bottom of understanding why Boeing made decisions that cost 346 people their lives may be left to the civil justice system. On April 30th, 2019 in Chicago, Illinois, Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg addressed the Boeing stockholders meeting. He attempted to justify why Boeing had installed the MCAS on the 737 MAX, but chose not to disclose its existence to the pilots responsible for flying passengers worldwide on the 737 MAX aircraft line. Mullenberg rejected the idea that the two recent crashes of the 737 MAX were a result of any technical slip by Boeing. As reported by the Seattle Times, Mullenberg admitted that erroneous information was sent to the airplanes on both flights by a faulty sensor on the fuselage, and this incorrect signal activated a new flight control system on the MAX that repeatedly pushed the jet's nose down. Despite this acknowledgement, Mullenberg insisted that there was no fault in the design, that led to the deaths of all the passengers on both flights. There is no technical slip or gap here. Mullenberg's statements indicated that the company was taking a stance of refusing to accept responsibility for the accidents, a position likely to be maintained in the ongoing civil litigation that had already commenced and was expected to expand in federal court in Chicago, Illinois. Representative DeFazio grilled Boeing CEO on why there wasn't any regulatory redundancy from day one. Now, uh, as you emphasize, uh, flight control will now compare inputs from both AOA sensors. And I guess the question is, why wasn't it that way from day one? In 2021, Boeing faced a fine of $2.5 billion from the Justice Department after being accused of fraud and conspiracy related to the two crashes. Investigators claimed that a former Boeing pilot provided misleading information to air safety regulators regarding the functioning of the MAX's flight control system. Senator Ted Cruz grilled Boeing CEO on the 737 MAX plane crashes while he detailed the exchange former Boeing CEO and a technical pilot had. Mr. Forkner, oh shocker alert. MCAS is now active down to M2. It's running rampant in the sim on me. At least that's what Vince thinks is happening. Gustafson's response, oh great. That means we have to update the speed trim description in volume two. Mr. Forkner, so basically I lied to the regulators unknowingly. Gustafson, it wasn't a lie. No one told us that was the case. Forkner, I'm leveling off at like 4,000 feet, 230 knots, and the plane is trimming itself like crazy. I'm like, what? Gustafson, that's what I saw on Sim 1. But on approach, I think that's wrong. Forkner, granted, I suck at flying, but even this was egregious. Did you read this document? And how did your team not put it in front of you, run in with their hair on fire, saying, we got a real problem here? How did that not happen? And what does that say about the culture at Boeing? Even the higher-ups and internals knew what was wrong with the system. Their statements were incriminating, and no one was held accountable. And, obviously, Boeing tried its best to cover up everything. The misleading statements, half-truths, and omissions communicated by Boeing employees to the FAA impeded the government's ability to ensure the safety of the flying public, said U.S. Attorney Aaron Neely Cox for the Northern District of Texas. The case sends a clear message. The Department of Justice will hold manufacturers like Boeing accountable for defrauding regulators, especially in industries where the stakes are this high.
U.S. authorities asserted that the company attempted to cover up their deception and prioritized profit over candor by concealing material information from the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, the primary airline regulator in the United States. Family Statements An inquest held in Horsham, West Sussex, investigated the deaths of humanitarian workers Sam Pengram and Oliver Vick, along with sustainability campaigner Joanna Toole. Sam brought so much joy to our lives, his mother Deborah shared, holding back tears. From his early years, he had a deep desire to help others. Sitting at home with her husband Mark and their other son Tom, finding the right words becomes a struggle for Deborah as she opens up about the profound impact the plane crash had on their lives. She reminisces about her 25-year-old Sam's infectious smile and his wicked sense of humor. He truly enriched our lives and his absence has left a significant void. Over the past four years, the family has been engaged in legal battles, seeking justice for Sam and pursuing compensation. It's been an ongoing battle, Mark remarks. I mean, in addition to the grief and the usual challenges that come with losing someone, you're forced to repeatedly revisit it. You may have to recount that story to your attorneys, to the opposing legal team, to a forensic psychologist, delving into the depths of what you experienced the day you received the news. It's been draining. A father whose five family members, including three children, lost their lives in the March crash of a Boeing 737 MAX jet in Ethiopia, accused the company of displaying utter prejudice and disrespect. In a gut-wrenching testimony, the victim asserted that Boeing's prioritization of share price and profits at the expense of the safety of human life and its close relationship with the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, had resulted in the two crashes leading to the tragic loss of his family. Boeing and their apologists want to shift scrutiny from their single-minded quest for short-term profits over safety. In written remarks, he expressed, I miss their laughter, their playfulness, their touch. I am empty. I feel that I should have been on that plane with them. My life has no meaning. It's difficult for me to think of anything else but the horror they must have felt. I cannot get it out of my mind. Addressing Congress, he warned that unless Boeing's conduct is addressed, another plane will dive to the ground, killing me or you. What happened to the 737s? Well, you'd be surprised that there are currently 1,160 737s actively flying around today. It's been more than three years since the FAA recertified the Boeing 737 MAX. Although the initial recovery was gradual, it has gained momentum since then. Currently, there are 1,160 active 737 MAXs, encompassing the MAX 8 and MAX 9 variants, while the MAX 7 and MAX 10 are in the progress but await approval. The predominant Boeing 737 MAX aircraft in operation is the 8 variant, making up the majority of the active fleet. The remaining aircraft are divided between the 737-8200 and the MAX 9. The mid-sized 8 variant takes the lead, with 956 examples spread across 69 carriers, overshadowing the larger 9 and the higher capacity 8200. Currently, neither the MAX 7 nor the MAX 10 is utilized by any airline, as both variants are still in the process of certification. Here's a quick rundown of which airlines fly the 737s. As of today, the families of the crash victims are still battling it out against Boeing, hoping to find justice for the deaths of their loved ones. That's all for today. If you'd like to stay up to date on our next documentary, consider subscribing. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.